Welcome to our Bible study for July 19th, 2020. Um, this is a standalone lesson, not part of a series. Next week we'll start a series beginning in Ephesians. The title of this lesson, How Should I Respond to Politics? Now, I think the timing is perfect because this is a major election year. And uh, it's going to be very contested, as you know, on the presidential side of things especially. But up and down the board, there's a lot going on. Um, and so we're going to be in Romans chapter 13, so if you want to get your Bible, and go there. Uh, but let's pray to start this off. Father, thank you for allowing us again to come to you, come before you, Father. Teach us in your word today as we look at, at Romans chapter 13. How should we respond to the governing officials? How should we respond to our state and local governments? How should we respond, Father? We want to respond in a way that honors you. So teach us in this, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you remember the first time you got to vote in a national election? It was July 1st, 1971, that the 26th Amendment was ratified. And that gave 18 years old, 18 year olds, the right to vote. Moved from 21 years old to 18 years old. So it was five years later that I got the opportunity to vote in my first national election. I really enjoyed the process and was glad I got to do it. I can remember being a little bit nervous, not knowing exactly what to do. But for me, that was a big deal. This August, our local uh, elections, a lot of the local elections will be happening August 4th. In November, all 435 uh, seats of Congress are up for vote. 34 Senate seats and the presidency of the United States, all of those are up. Now, usually up to this point, we get inundated with political ads and promotions and phone calls and all that kind of stuff really getting into it. Now, COVID-19 has kind of squelched some of that. But over the last couple of weeks, I've noticed an uptick in the number of those types of things that I'm beginning to see in here. Receiving junk mail um, that just has candidates standing. And here's who you should vote, vote for me. And that's what they're saying. Over these next few months, there's going to be this endless debates, endless discussions about politics and how should we respond. The United States right now is deeply divided, um, and both sides believe they're right. And both sides want to win this election because they believe if they win this election, they can make America great. No matter what people say with the magma and all that kind of stuff, both sides want to make America great. They have different ways of doing that. They have different philosophies, but both sides want to make America great. At least give them credit for that. They want to be in power because they believe they can do it. But politics are a real minefield. Well, they're off. Politics are concerned so much about only the outcome. Christians have to be more concerned about the process. Machiavelli, a 16th century philosopher, wrote this. The ends justify the mean. He wrote in one of his works, For although the act condemns the doer, the end may justify him. He believed that if our goal was good, we had the right to use any means possible to accomplish that goal, to achieve that goal. Unfortunately, many Christians have that same philosophy. And unfortunately for them, that philosophy is found nowhere in Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture does it say the end justifies the means, at least from this standpoint and what it means. God called us to a different standard, and that standard, standard has to be obedience and love so that we can show respect and honor to God and how we respond to our government and politics and how we approach that. In Romans 13, Paul is addressing our attitude and behavior towards government. And we definitely need his guidance as we are in this season of, of politics and the uprise and what all that means. While we may not like certain politicians, we may disagree with where they stand, God calls us to respond, respond not based on emotions, but with actions. And the actions that honor God. Love for Christ and for others is to permeate 
everything that we do, whether it has to do with politics or not. But more than anything else, as we engage in those discussions, as we are involved in the political process, whatever level that is, our love for Christ and love for others have to be utmost on our mind. So let's go ahead and get into the reading. Let's look at the first four verses of, of Romans chapter 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. Those who do so will bring judgment on themselves, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of one of the authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Now, the life in Rome was no better roses. It wasn't peaceful, it wasn't pleasant, um, or it wasn't very prosperous, especially for Christians. It was a, it was a um, civilization and an empire that slavery, sexual ex exploitation, violence, cruelty, corruption. If you were talking about the Roman Empire, those were the things that came to mind. In the midst of all that, Paul is writing to Christians and believers and telling them, you know, verse 1 says, let everyone submit to governing authorities. How do you do that? If everything that they're doing or what seems to be promoted goes against what you believe God, how do you submit to that? That's what our lesson really covers. Rule of law is a reminder that a society must have some form of government that guides the people and and the process so we can live in peace. Although the idea of rule of law did not get published or was not talked about until the 1990s, it was shown here in Paul's writing those many years before that. One thing we know about God, God is a law of order and things are kept in order by God and they're held together by his authority. Things in order and the orderness of God, orderliness of God, applies when it comes to governments too, since God institutes governments to maintain order. As we live in submission to government, we learn what it means to live in submission to God himself. Look at what verse 4 says. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. So, consequently, failure to submit to authority he has placed in our lives is Rebellion. It says, whoever, in verse 2, whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And think about it, folks. Has government been beneficial to you and been beneficial to your community? And we may look at it, especially with the atmosphere that we're in now, and go, oh, there's no way. But think about it. Governments are run, we know that governments are run by uh, imperfect people. Politicians are imperfect people. Imperfect people do imperfect things. At times, these imperfect things go against the will of God. And this challenge confronts us today. It also confronted the apostles of the day. In Acts chapter 5, if you look, we'll see that the authorities arrested the apostles and instructed them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. But the apostles said... We must obey God rather than people. Some people use that as an excuse for not getting involved in government, not paying taxes, those kind of things, but we cannot use that as a loophole that allows us to disobey government whenever it suits us. The Apostles' example is a reminder that we are to live in obedience to God first, and we are to live in obedience to the government with respect honor and integrity live a life relate to the government respond to the government with respect integrity and honor look at romans 13 5-7 
you know, it's it's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because it's possible because of the possible punishment, but also a matter of conscience. Verse five says, therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also in a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes for the authorities are God's servant. You give their full who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone that you owe what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Our testimony shows up in everything that we do, even politics. So Christians are to be model citizens. We are instructed in verse 5 to submit not only because of punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. So, we are to do our best to represent Christ in the way we live our lives. And we do that by living a life of integrity and honor related to our community, related to our government. But Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, added an element of servitude to that obedience. Again, he's dealing with Roman people that were lording over the Jewish people. And here's what he said. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. That comes out of Matthew 5, 41. Jesus also said, Give then to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. That's out of Matthew 22, 21. Many things may belong to the government, but everything belongs to God, including government authorities. The authorities are God's servant. Our obedience to govern is important. To government is important because of these three reasons. God uses government to build us up. From road building, maintenance, to emergency, to feeding the poor and the elderly, there are many ways that the government helps us. The government's ultimate role is to look out for the nation, the community, the state, for the betterment and the well-being, and so its citizens can prosper. Secondly, God uses our lives as testimony of his faithful love and unselfish grace. The world's watching how we live. We know that. Believers are were first called believe, were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, in that day, that term was an insult, was used to insult them. But really what it was doing is it was expressing what they were doing. They were living a Christ-like life, a life that honored God. When we live as good citizens, people learn of the faithfulness and unselfishness and the unselfish grace of God. Number three is God uses governments for his purpose. God is working on his provincial problem. God's working on his plan. I can't say the big word, sorry. In Acts 17, it says, From one man he has made every nationality to live under the whole earth and had determined their appointed times and boundaries of where they live. We are sometimes so focused on our own lives and, and what's happening in our lives and our concerns that we forget that God's working. God's working all the time, even in government. We forget that. So remember, live your lives to honor God every day. Don't get so focused on your own personal concerns and all that you lose sight of the fact that God is in control. The next couple of verses, we will discover we are to respond to political debates and disagreement with love, not hate. So often I see people on Facebook, social media, throw something out there, and sometimes they throw it out there just to start an argument. Lots of times they throw it out there because this is truly what they believe, knowing that um, there would be some backlash from that from some people. I'm very careful about what I put, and there's been times I've been so tempted to write something on Facebook uh, no, let's back off because I want it to come across with love and respect. I do not want to do anything that would cause somebody hurt. But there are, I do have some strong beliefs about some things. But it's rare that you will see me post those on any social media. But let's go on and read verses 8 through 10. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there is may be and are summed up 
in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, it may seem that Paul has um, stepped away from the political aspect of things and government talking about that and moved into loving your neighbor. Well, that's not the case because if you look at it within the context, he's dealing with our approach to those that we disagree with. And our government authorities are some people that we do disagree with at times, but yet we still need to show love to those that we disagree with. Every system is made better when it is fueled by love, and no one has a greater obligation to love than a Christian. So whether we agree or disagree, our approach to debates, discussions, uh, our voting and all that stuff, is, God, how we can we honor you, and how can we show love in this process? Verse 10 said, love does no harm to a neighbor. neighbor. Love seeks to do what's right. When our, when our political actions are driven by God's love, our love for God, and love for others, we will lose selfish attitudes. Our Political actions must line up with Jesus. Our vote must glorify God. We do this when we care about all the things that God cares about. This also means that Christians should never compromise our witness for a political agenda. It is right to support politicians when they support what God teaches. But in the same way, we should be willing to call out those same politicians when they're wrong. Either way, we must always serve God first, and we must always show love in the process. We all have times that we disagree with the government and the position they've taken or a law that they've passed or established. So how should we respond? Here's a couple of scenarios. Is it okay not to pay taxes to the government because it says abortion is okay? Or what about the, the fact that we believe that our government officials are corrupt so... Why should we mess with even obeying them? Well, look at what verse 7 says. Therefore, love is a fulfillment of the law. Whether we agree or disagree, and you look back at what it says, we are to submit to authorities unless that authority is going against what God teaches. And we have to even be careful then. It's not our interpretation of what God teaches, but what does the word say? When you get into scripture, what does it say? When, when we get involved in politics, whether it's just going out and voting, whether it's just talking about something, or maybe run for an office, our standards are to be higher than the world's. And we should have a higher value on what, how God looks at, how we look at life because of how God sees us. As we follow Christ, we should stay out of all the verbal bashing and the the nonsensical chatter that goes into politics and so often that degenerates into something that that is just hateful. We are to point to Jesus as our example and deliberately aim to reflect his love in our lives. We should respect those in authority over us and pray for them that they will be successful in their God-given responsibilities. Scripture has example after example where God has used ungodly people to accomplish his task. Whether we believe a politician is a godly man, godly woman or not, we should be praying for them. First and foremost, praying that God will touch their life, praying that God will guide the decisions that they make, that they will come to know him if they don't, they will come into personal relationship if they don't. That should be our number one responsibility when it comes to being involved in politics. The point of this lesson is to help us learn to reflect Christ in how we interact with politics and the government. Titus 3 1 says this Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. When it comes to the politics of our day, how can we reflect Christ's love? Well, here are three ways that I think it's possible. First off, Practice love. Again, we are in a season of election, so politics is a common topic of discussions. At times, we as Christians find ourselves at very much 
uh, at odds about what we believe and at odds on an issue. But we have to maintain love for others in our conversations and our discussions. Sometimes it's better just to walk away because that may save your reputation. It also may keep you from saying something that will um, show that you there's not love in your heart. But sometimes you can stand wanting to honor God with that. And if you do that, God will honor you with that. Number two, dive into the Word. As you get into issues that we face, as you hear about um, things that are about to happen, you find out uh, what platform a person is running on, what they stand for, those kind of things. Dive into the Word. Find out what God's Word says about whatever it is that you're dealing with. See how it speaks to those issues, but continually seek to align with God. But again, folks, do it with love and humility. God loves them too, whoever them are for you. So don't assume that you're somehow better because you're a follower of Christ and they may not be. God died for them just like he died for you. So folks, whatever you do, make sure you love and humility are central to what you do. And third, participate. Are you active participant or are you just complain from the sidelines? Have you been involved in the voting process? Are you out there trying to influence the discourse? And in the old days, they would do that standing on the public square, voicing their opinion. Um, preachers would do that, would stand. A terror preacher would come to town, and they would preach a God's word and God's message. Have you been involved in political process? Now, you may not run for office. You may not even get involved in debate, but you can pray, and you can vote. And I believe it's important for us to do that. Get active. But let your love for Christ be the influence that you have. No other reason. You get out there, you, you're wanting to vote against somebody because you don't like them? Or are you voting against them because they're not standing for what you believe God wants them should be standing for? Can you support the other person for the same reason? Are you struggling with that? Again, folks, pray. Pray. Pray, pray. Ask God to bless them. For believers, um, we have to learn it's okay to disagree, but we also have to learn we should not be disagreeable. We can agree to disagree and still remain friends. We can agree to disobey and be very civil toward each other. We can agree to disagree. You know, sometimes we may lose, but, you know, honestly, that's okay. Even though we may not believe it is, but honestly, that's okay because ultimately, in the end, God wins, folks. And if we stand on that, yeah, we're going to lose a battle every now and then, but God has won the war, and that's an exciting thing for us to stand on. Let's end with that. Let's have prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for allowing us the opportunity to uh, come before you in Bible study again, Father, as I've said. Father, again, we are in this process of election. And Father, uh, based on your word, I understand and know that the government is put in place for our good. But it's also run by imperfect people, whether you're Republican or Democrat, Independent, or one of the others. None of us are perfect, but you are. So, Father, my prayer is those politicians that know you as their Lord and Savior will go to you first as they begin to make decisions, as they look to that process. That they will go to you first in their search for what is best and what is right. And, Father, that by the way they live their lives, they will influence those maybe on the other side of the aisle, they're on the same side, whether Republican or Democrat, that some of those can come to know you because of that person being involved, whether it's local, state, national. And Father, be with us as we participate in politics, as we vote. We want to honor you, Father, in all that we do. And so, Father, with our voting, we want to honor you. When we get in debates for people, we want to honor you. Help us do that, Father. Help us be of honor to you. I thank you and praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, thank you for listening, and thank you for being part of this study. Again, this was Stand Alone. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians, so get ready for it next week. I look forward to being back here, and you all take care. Have a great week.